I'm sick and tired of living in this small house. You need to make more money so we can get a decent place to live. I'll sneak out and meet you around midnight. My parents are clueless, and they'll never know. As long as you live under this roof, you'll do what I say. I don't care what you say. You can't stop me from going to the party. I saw you checking her out. I was just looking at the brand of her jeans. I thought they might look good on you. All right, who's going to pray this time? Me, dear Jesus, thank you for all the ways you blessed our family. I can remember it like it was yesterday uh, when I knew I had become my parents. I remember it because uh, when my daughter would go out on a date, I made sure that the boys she went out on a date with understood that I am indeed the leader of her life. And when he's with her, I am the leader of his life as well. And that I reserve the right to put GPS tracking on her phone or even an ankle bracelet if the need be so that I would know where she is at all times. I reserve the right to actually come and join them on their date if I decided to do that. And I definitely reserve the right to tell them what time they had to be home and if they weren't early, they were late. Now, that all went very well. It was perfect. I never had an issue all through high school. It was the summer after high school that a little tiny issue developed. They came home one night five minutes late. Five minutes late. Now, I had explained the rules quite a few years earlier, so I was full of grace. No, no, I wasn't full of grace. As a matter of fact, when they came in the front door, they found me sitting there. We have this little pew in our, uh, in, in our vestibule, and I was just sitting there, and they walked in to find me, so thrilled that they were home five minutes late. And I remember, because I almost, it almost came at me as if they were shout, my parents were shouting at me when I said, the rules haven't changed just because you've graduated from high school. As long as you live under my, there it is, there it is. As long as you live under my rule, you'll live under my rules. Yeah, you guys are all over this. We can just go home. But, but the interesting thing about that is I, I have to ask myself, uh, what about for me? What rules am I required to live by under his roof? Because let's face it, men and women, we're all living under his roof. And if we want to have homes, whether you're single, married, divorced, single again, uh, you have a million children or none, all of us live under his roof. And he has given us loving, compassionate, wise guidelines for which to live our lives. And so I ask myself, as long as I'm living under his roof, what are his rules for me? Now, we don't like that word, rules. You know, we're, we're a body who believe that we're all about grace and mercy, not about law. And yet, Jesus and the apostles and the writers of the New Testament, all of them explain to us that God wants us to live by a standard he has designed. And he, there are unique things about your life that are special to you and different than me, and yet there are indeed universal standards for the human race that he wants us to know. Now, one of the things that we teach people when we go on our leadership training around the world is this. It's probably the most important thing we teach. The most important person you will ever lead is yourself. Exactly. Somebody's been to the training. You, the most important you person you will ever lead is yourself. How are you doing with that? Well, if you want to find out Jesus' standard for living, a great place to go is the Sermon on the Mount. And if you have a Bible or a device, uh, go to Matthew chapter 5, and then I want you to, to put your finger in there or a bookmark on your device, and I also want you to open your Bibles to Colossians chapter 3. And we're going to try to unpack this idea today 
of living under the roof of God in terms of his standards. Now, it, the whole Sermon on the Mount is about Jesus raising the bar higher than rules. He's saying that our, our connection with God or what God hopes to uh, have in his relationship with us is something more than just following rules and rituals and regulations. And so he's raising the bar on our life. It's understanding our own condition and admitting it, confessing it to him, and turning away from it to God's design and his ideas for our life. That's really what the whole Sermon on the Mount is about. Receive God's grace and mercy. And then he says this in Matthew chapter 5, verse 6. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Now, those of you who've been around Southland for a while know I've, I've, I've mentioned this verse on numerous occasions, and I've tried to unpack for you the original language here because there's three key words in this verse that you need to know. The first one is hunger, which comes from the Greek word, that's what they wrote it in, pena, which means if I don't get fed, I'm going to die. Then the word thirst, which comes from the Greek word dipsa, which is the original language of that, which means if I don't get something to drink, I'm going to die. And then dikos is the word for righteousness, which means to be correctly or rightly in relationship with God. In other words, right, my spirit is right with God. Now let's put it all together, can we? Let's put this puzzle together. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for their spirit being right with God so much that if they don't get it, they're going to die. He's saying that's what happens to the person who's really discovered what it means to be connected to God in relationship. I am so hungry and thirsty for all that he wants for my life that if I don't get it, I'm going to die. That's pretty passionate, right? Right? And that's what he's calling us to when we live under his roof. I mean, apply this to your home. No matter what your marital status or how many kids you have or if you don't have kids, Jesus tells me to hunger and thirst for my spirit to be right with God in such a way that if I don't have that experience, I'm going to die. Now, if everyone in the house is passionately pursuing righteousness like that, I'm telling you, the individual and the family will be fulfilled. I mean, that's a common goal that we can all chase after. Uh, purpose accomplished, in other words. They'll be satisfied is another English translation of filled. Uh, what is the design and desire of my heart? Ask yourself that question. What is the design and desire, I mean the main desire of my heart? Jesus says, I'm telling you, the way you're going to be fulfilled in your life, satisfied, is when that number one desire is being right in your spirit with God. That's what he's explaining. The satisfied home experience happens when everyone in the house is in passionate pursuit of righteousness. Now here's the thing. Colossians 3, chapter 1. They help us know what that means. Paul, the writer to Colossians, he helps us understand what that means. Chapter 3, verse 1. Since then, you have been raised up with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Now, set your hearts. In other words, here it is. Leadership in the home Whoever's the leader of your home, leadership in the home must first model the pursuit of righteousness. Let's be clear about that. I mean, if I'm going to have rules for you to live under my roof, I need to extend those rules to myself. And I need to say to myself, there's number one in my life, the passionate pursuit of righteousness with Jesus. One of the basic principles we teach in, in leadership is this. It's simple. When you fail to plan, you plan to fail. Exactly. When you fail to plan, you plan to fail. And I'm telling you, that's exactly the same thing in our homes. It, it, it's true in our relationships, in our marriages, in our parenting, in dealing with our parents. When we fail to plan, we plan to fail. 
Now, if leaders of the family don't have a plan for their family, they will simply become a product of the culture. I mean, that's, that's the reality. You, you just kind of start to blend in with how other families around you function because you haven't really created a plan that has a passion driving it. Something or someone, men and women, is influencing you. Somebody is. Who is it? Who are you allowing to influence you? Now, here's, here's the common American life. I mean, it goes something like this. It's a little different based on your generation, but it's something like this. You wake up in the morning. Good job today, by the way, everyone. Well done. You wake up in the morning, then you maybe do one of these out of order, but you get yourself ready for the day and you go eat something, or maybe you go eat something and get yourself ready for the day, but those two things happen. And then you go on with your plans of the day. It's probably work for many. Um, it, It might be school if you're a student in school, and then you go through that process, and then after school or after work, you come home, you have dinner, maybe watch a show, go to bed, get up in the morning, do it all over again. I mean, for most Americans, that's pretty much life. I mean, there might be some afternoon activities, extracurriculars, if you have kids and you got to go do all of that. Weekends come, you try to fix a couple things, maybe mow the grass, and you do it all over again. You see, we can get into this rhythm of the culture and not have established for ourselves what is truly the most important thing for us to pursue. What if your life or the life of your family was more than the common American life? What if it was more because you realize that more doesn't happen by accident? It happens because I make a decision that I want more than just the common American life. You know, get up, go to work, come home, watch TV, go to bed, and do it all over again. Maybe I want more because I'm being intentional about my pursuit of righteousness. And I'm just going to let you know right now, the things that you do daily in life are the reflection of what you are passionately pursuing. I mean, the stuff that you do, your calendar tells me, this is what I chase hard after. So here's what he said. Since then, you've been raised up with Christ. Here we are, back at the resurrection again. By the way, happy Easter. Yeah, yeah, since you've been raised up with Christ, you're followers of Christ, what now? Set your hearts on things above. Set your heart on. Now, what do you do when you set your heart on? What do you set your heart on? What is exceedingly important to you. Leaders in the home must answer this question for themselves before they ever hope to answer it for their families. What is exceedingly important to you? I'm living under my roof, so what passions have I chosen for myself that are non-negotiable? that I must always follow. If I don't get them in my life, I'm going to die. What have I decided is that important for me? I don't care what generation you are. Every day, you have the chance to answer that question. Paul makes it simple for you. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. What does that mean? Am I supposed to spend every waking moment thinking about Jesus? Well, kind of, yeah. In other words, what is it that Jesus has designed me for? What is it that Jesus wants me to do? Take my will, conform it to yours, to yours, O Lord. That, that's what he wants from us. Am I seeking to know him and his design for my life, for my every day? It starts with making a decision to arrange my schedule, to arrange my values, to arrange my resources uh, around a desire to know Jesus more than anything else in my life and what he wants for me and for my family. That's got to be the first 
question you answer as a leader in the home. I, I, I was playing a little golf this past week. I was in an outing, and, uh, and we're coming up on, on uh, the last hole, and I see two or three of the club members of this club working on their short game around the putting green. And I said to one of the guys I was playing with, man, I need to do that. I need to get out and practice more. I need to start taking this seriously. And probably as soon as I got in the cart, I wanted to smack myself in the head. Really? Really? Do you really need to get out there and practice your golf game more? I mean, really? Is it that important to you? Uh, the answer was no. No, I, I don't need to care more about my golf game. I need to care more about knowing God and letting him lead my life. That's what I need to practice. I need a lot of practice, men and women, but not on my golf game. I need more practice with him. Now, if I'm a pro golfer, by the way, sure, you know, practice more. But I'm not. And I just want to inform you today, I will never be a pro golfer. But I know who I am every day. It's someone who needs to be passionately pursuing righteousness in my life. What if I practiced more? What if I practiced prayer more? What if I practiced reading God's word and un to understand it more? What if I practiced being a great husband more? What if I practiced being a great father more? What if I practiced being a better preacher more? And all the people said, yeah, 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 thanks. <laughs> what if I practiced those things more? What if I practiced setting my heart on things above more. What would happen in my life? You see, I'm learning this, and, and, and I'm tell, talking to young pa parents about this. I don't want to make sure my kids are the best baseball players, or the best band members, or the best singers, before I make sure they understand the value of prayer, and the value of worship, and the value of God's word in their life. Is, is that, as a parent, what you do? Do you always put those things first and then give God what's left over? Before I can expect them, my children, to embrace what God wants to happen in their life under his roof, um, by the way, what does he want? Righteousness. Before I can communicate that to them, I've got to make a plan to do it myself. And it, and it starts right here. Keep reading in Colossians, verse 2. Here's what he says. Set your mind on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind. Because the passionate pursuit of righteousness starts, men and women, with how you think. It's how you think. It's going to change the way you are. Setting your heart on things above is a decision of the will. It's making a decision that this is indeed the most important thing for me. And that's lived out in changing the stuff you are thinking about. Now, I got a question for you. Um, what do you spend your most time thinking about? I mean, it's a simple question, right? I mean, is that a simple question? What do you spend most of your time thinking about? Is it work? Well, sure. I mean, that makes sense. It, it, it sure, certainly does. Is it what's for dinner? Well, okay, you know, we got to eat, right? So maybe I think about what's for dinner. I know Stephanie's asking, what are we having for dinner at breakfast? You know, what, that, that's important. Is it negotiating the kids' schedules? You know, the grandkids' schedules? You know, I get it. They're obviously very important, and you're there to care for them and help them grow. But when and where do you just think about the things that are most important? I mean, where do you set aside time to really focus on the things that are most important? Honestly, we do not often think about thinking. We think thinking just happens organically, Instead of saying, I'm going to be serious about thinking about God. Now, did you see the words he used? I mean, I, I'm just telling you what he said here. Set your minds. Set an intentional act where you make a decision. I'm going to put my mind on the things of Christ. 
set your minds. Once my heart determines the important, my mind now can choose to focus on these things. I mean, he said it twice, set your hearts, set your minds. Where? On Christ. That's what he's calling us to do. I hope the intensity and the intentionality of what he's saying here isn't lost on you. Because God knows your struggles. God knows the tension in your life. God knows the stuff that's constantly barraging your thoughts, barraging you uh, with, with a desire to pull your affections away from him. And that's why he says it. I get it. And that's why I'm telling you, set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. Now, have you ever felt so busy, so overwhelmed, so not in control of your own life that you barely have time to go to the bathroom, let alone meditate with God? You ever felt like that? I mean, the whole world is in control of me. I'm on the leash of my family. I'm on the leash of my work. I'm on the leash of something other than my own will. Have you ever felt like that? And you say, and, and I'm sitting here putting the guilt trip on you about setting your minds on Christ? You know, but, but, the, but here's the thing. Just about everything we're doing in life is some kind of choice we've made to do. And, 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 and I don't know, sometimes we say, I made these choices and I don't know how to get out of them. I, I don't know what else to do. So I'm saying today, here it is, make a plan. Make a plan on when you're going to think about the things of Christ so that those things permeate the rest of your life. When am I going to seriously think about the really important stuff in life? Does it mean getting up a little earlier? Does it mean setting down that novel that you've really been into a lot lately? Does it mean not picking up the remote until I've had some quiet time with the Lord? <laughs> you know, Stephanie used to crack me up on this because she'd, she'd always be looking for this time to have with the Lord. And, and when we, our kids were small, those of you who've been moms, you get it, right? I mean, this is uh, hard work. And a lot of times you have no choice in the matter. And she's like, when am I going to do this? So her trick was to go into the bathroom. They sort of innately knew that the bathroom is a place that's kind of private. And she would go into the bathroom, but she would never lock the door. And I said, Stephanie, you know, as long as you keep the door unlocked, they will find you. They will find you. And she said, I know but if I lock the door, they'll just beat on the door anyway because they know I'm in there. But, but she would go in there just, I mean, just to find a place so that she could be quiet and alone. The whole point is she was intentional about it. She made time and place to think about the things of God. If you're not thinking about the things of God, you'll default to thinking like the world around you. You'll just become them. Just leave your tough marriage because you deserve it. You think like the world. Spend more time, spend more than you should because if you look good, you'll feel good. And you start thinking like the world. Just skip worship today. You can pray in your sleep. Just think like the world. Again, if you're not thinking about the things of God, you'll default to thinking like the world around you. And how you think, we've said it a million times, is how you feel. And how you think determines what you will do. And honestly, I talk to young parents all the time, and they wonder why their families are in such trouble when all they've done is accept what a world devoid of God thinks is important. And, and they wonder why they have such a mess. What we, remember, the most important person you will ever lead is yourself. Look what he says in verse 3. For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. 
You see, that the passionate pursuit of righteousness is realized whether you're a leader in the home or a kid in the home, whether you're just in the home and others seem to be in charge of you. Here's the reality. The passionate pursuit of righteousness is realized when you embrace the life of Jesus. He was God in the flesh and very wise and told us how to think and live. And sometimes I think it boils down to whose roof you're actually living under. When Jesus preached his Sermon on the Mount, he was opening the hearts of people who thought they were right with God, but they weren't. They were living under their own roofs instead of living in the house of the Lord. And they looked religious, and they sounded spiritual, and they stayed away from shady places and sketchy people. You know, they followed all the rules, but they still wanted control of their own hearts and their own minds, and they wanted control of others. And that's the amazing thing about God. When we're full of pride and self-determination, he still loves us. And I want you to know that today. He loves you. Have I said it enough? He's crazy about you. And he went to a great deal of trouble to rescue you when he came to the world and died on the cross. And when Paul was writing to the Christians in Colossae, he was helping them realize that they might be looking for fulfillment or satisfaction in a lot of the wrong places. I mean, right after this passage, he says it, you've died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. So he said, this is, this is the neighborhood you're living in, in Jesus' neighborhood. He said, but here's what can happen. He says, put to death then, if you've died and your life is hidden with Christ in God, he says, you need to put these things to death. It's a list that he gives you right after this passage. He says, put to death sexual expression that is outside of marriage. Don't do that. Impurity, lust, evil desires. He says, throw away greed and anger and libel and malice and slander and filthy language. He says, look, you know, those things aren't going to satisfy you. They're not going to fulfill you. They're not going to give you what you're most looking for in life. Put those things to death. They'll always leave you wanting. But die to yourself and die with Christ. That's when you're going to be fulfilled. He says all of these are where your heart and mind used to be. But they aren't there for you to experience anymore because you've met Jesus and he has raised the bar. He's giving you a better way to think, a better way to live. God calls us to an extreme decision, men and women. Live like everybody else in a lost world or die to it and live like Jesus designed you to live. By his death, Jesus gave everyone the opportunity to live forever in a place so much better than this. Maybe you have just this amazing, awesome house under an amazing, awesome roof. I have news for you. It's going to even be better. It's going to be even better than your place. And he's offering that to you. Now, when we die with Jesus... We embrace that future, only we embrace it to live in it in this life, now, in this moment. Not just in eternity, someday when we get there, it's all going to be great, but I'm just going to keep doing what I'm doing here. He said, no, you don't have to wait for there to live the life God wants you to live. You can live it now. Die to this world and trust him. If we hope to have homes of righteousness we must die to our selfishness and receive his forgiveness. That's what he's offering to you. I mean, right now, in this moment, no matter how many times you feel like you failed, he offers you that grace and mercy today with new passions and new ways of thinking.
It's the example Jesus gave us for all of his children living under his roof. I'll sacrifice for you so you'll know I can be trusted. Did you hear that, leaders in the homes? I'll sacrifice for all of you so you know I can be trusted. In the past few years, I've had a lot of interesting conversations with young parents, particularly young dads. And, 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 and there were three guys that all at one time I was talking with, different ind- ind- individually, not together, but their stories seemed to be all pretty much the same. You know, they, they, they had families fighting. They had children living in rebellion. There was no peace in their homes at all. And so I asked them about their walks with God. I said, well, tell me about how you're doing in your daily walk with God, how he's helping you to, to think differently and, and, and about your passions. And all of them indicated that they did pray some and that they read their Bible some and that they tried to get to church when their kids didn't have activities on Sunday mornings. And, 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 and yet everything was so interesting to me is that they wanted to make sure, they, they spent time with their family, they wanted to make sure their kids were always at all of their activities, but they didn't want to make sure their kids were part of worship and part of growing in their walk with God. And they weren't being leaders in the home of that reality. And, and I told them, and I, I'm just going to paraphrase here, but I told them basically, when you're ready to die to this world and you're ready to make your walk with God and your family's walk with God your number one priority, I think you'll begin to see perhaps healing and help for the tension that's in your home. Now, I'm not saying that that always happens because I've known also godly men, godly women who've tried to lead their home in righteousness and and their kids were were, were hard (laughs) to raise and they were trouble for them. But I am saying that the best chance you have is passionately pursuing Jesus yourself and having a plan to to help your family passionately pursue him as well. What is your heart and mind set upon? What is your plan for leading yourself in the passionate pursuit of righteousness? And what is your plan for leading your family in the passionate pursuit of righteousness? It's interesting. Here's how he wraps up this little paragraph in verse 4. Look at it here. When Christ, who is your life, there it is, appears, then then you also will appear with him in glory. Look, I love you very much. As your pastor, I do. I I do, and I pray for you. So please, listen to him. When you come before Christ, he won't ask you what your golf handicap was. When you come before Christ, he won't ask you what your kid's scoring average was. When you come before Christ, he won't ask you what kind of car you drove. Those kind of things aren't going to be important to him. I get it. Some of these things help you spend time with your family and connect with your family. I I understand that, and that's good. But have they become more important than leading yourself in righteousness and leading your family in the passionate pursuit of Jesus? Those things aren't the issue. Rather, did you receive his grace in your life and allow his spirit to take control so that you could ultimately have a life that is fulfilled? That's what he's calling you to, men and women. A life of heart peace, a life of joy, a life of security and confidence, and a life of wisdom as he leads you through it. Before you can lead others, lead yourself in a passionate pursuit of righteousness.